When I was in my third year of mechanical engineering, I was looking for work positions for my co-op term. And I came across a job posting from the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. And it was, it was something along the lines of they were looking for someone to help with their animatronic werewolves. Um, I did not get the job. I did not end up working in werewolves. But it really drew my attention to the incredibly unusual projects that can exist at this bridging point between engineering and the arts. And I realized that the work I was most excited about were these strange discipline hopping projects that combined engineering and science with literature and music and film. And what I want to talk about today are the really exciting research opportunities that currently exist that merge research in STEM and the humanities, and especially that combine science and literature. Um, you know, I think with the modern university setup, it's quite easy to let ourselves get channeled down into a very specific focus. But the reality is that we need people who have a diverse range of training and skills. We need scientists who are also writers and artists and musicians, and we need artists who are also scientists. And this is useful for designing theme parks, but we really, really need it for talking about climate science and thinking about how we communicate climate science. So I initially did engineering here at Dalhousie. I, like a lot of people, I had a really hard time, I think, picking what I wanted to do for my major. I loved math and science, but I also really loved writing and music and theater. And I mean, I was, I was very happy in engineering. I did co-op, which meant that I got to sample a number of work and research positions. And I did end up doing quite a bit of climate research. So I worked in a number of climate labs. And at the end, I realized that what I really wanted to do was think about how that work in the lab was distributed to the public. How did we write about it? How do people, what's the history of how people have written about science? So after my engineering degree, I was very fortunate to get a Rhodes Scholarship to study at the University of Oxford. And this was, the Rhodes is amazing because, particularly because it lets, it gives you the freedom to pursue whatever course of study you choose. So instead of doing graduate studies, I decided to do another undergraduate degree, this time in English literature. And this was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I was able to return to a lot of these historical scientific texts, the mathematical texts that I'd encountered in engineering, but this time from a completely different perspective. And I was also able to take techniques and skills from engineering and math and apply them to literary texts. So one of my, one of my favorite projects that I worked on was a coding analysis of Shakespeare. So I was really interested in how current performers were dealing with rhythmically complicated bits of Shakespeare. How were these rhythms in Shakespeare actually being heard on the modern stage? So I took audio from a whole bunch of different performances and I had code and programs that would break down how long the actors spent on each syllable and you could get plots to visualize the rhythm and metrics and stats to analyze what choices were being made, what the effect that this was having. And I mean, I, I had a lot of fun. It was really exciting. And this is really only a small window into the kind of digital humanities research that's currently happening. This is a really exciting research area. And I mean, probably the most famous example of this kind of research is authorship debates. There is, you can, with statistical analysis and computer analysis, you, uh, researchers are analyzing the grammar and the syntax and the word usage of texts to help settle debates over who wrote what. So the Oxford Shakespeare editions recently changed their attribution um, to Shakespeare's Henry VI plays to be a collaboration between Shakespeare and the playwright Christopher Marlowe. This is really fascinating research and I like to think of this kind of work as science being applied to literature. So the techniques of science and math being turned on these literary texts. And for this type of research to work, you really need people who have a diverse range of training. You need literary scholars who have a strong background in stats and in math. And you need mathematicians who are interested in working in literary texts and who are interested in collaborating. I know for me, it was really exciting to take code and techniques that I'd previously used for phytoplankton modeling and greenhouse gas detection and apply them to Shakespeare. It was just a lot of fun. So that's sort of science on literature. 
But the opposite relationship also works, which is taking techniques of literary analysis and turning them back on science and scientific texts. And this can raise so many interesting questions because we're looking at these historical texts, which are, you know, 200, 300, or far older, three years old. And they are now texts that found, form the foundation for a lot of modern science. And so we can think about how, how are these texts working? Who is their audience? How are they communicating what they're trying to communicate? These, you know, these historical scientists and natural philosophers were often speaking to a much broader public they were speaking to people who maybe hadn't seen what the scientists themselves had seen under a telescope or through a telescope or a microscope. And they were often trying to make a case for the value of the work. You know, you have Robert Hooke who is looking through his microscope and he's writing about it and he's trying to convince people that it's even worth the time and the energy to look at things under a microscope. In my degree, I looked at the work of William Herschel, who, an astronomer who's now best known as being the person who discovered the planet Uranus. But he has whole portions of his texts. Again, he's talking to an audience who largely hasn't seen what he's seen through his telescope. And he has a portion of one of his texts where he just describes leading the reader upstairs into the stars. And the stars are written about as kind of coming towards the reader as you get closer. And it's an incredible piece of writing. And really these Herschel and other scientists are using incredibly rich literary allusions and metaphors and references to try to communicate their work. And this is really the realm for literary scholars to look at. And there's so much value that can be gained from thinking about how do these texts work? How has science been communicated and how is it being communicated now? So that sort of literary techniques on science. And that brings me to my final point, which is the importance of these interdisciplinary studies and people with a broad range of techniques and interests, especially when it comes to talking about climate science. So, I mean, of course, we're at a point now where we have so much research coming out and so much coming out of the lab and such a difficulty in getting it to reach people and connect with people. There's a lot of climate apathy. You know, I think we all know the feeling of like you see the article pop up and you know it's important and you just you just don't want to deal with it right now. So how do we get people interested and get people engaged and trusting what's coming out of the lab? And you know, this is a problem that's not just for the scientists. This is a problem that's also for the artists and for people who do both. So my current research, I'm currently doing a master's in the history of science, and I'm looking at how people in the early 19th century wrote about changes to their climate. And this is a really interesting period because, for example, in 1816, there was a year that became known as the year without a summer. So there was across North America and Europe, there was terrible weather, it was cold, it was dark and rainy, there were crop failures and food shortages, there was talk of apocalypse, and the poet Byron wrote a poem about the sun going cold and the earth going dark. So I'm really interested in how did, how are people writing about this period? We now know that these effects were caused by the eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia, but at the time people didn't know it was causing it. So I'm interested in what forms of writing emerged at this kind of event. How were poets and early meteorologists and scientists writing about it and describing it? And who was the public looking to for explanations? And I think there's so much that we can learn about the relationship between literature and science and climate at the time and also for our current situation. So, I mean, this is, there are many other projects that are emerging at this kind of intersection point. We have environmental humanities networks, which are getting a whole bunch of disciplines together to talk about issues like this. We have environmental histories. There are all kinds of projects that you really wouldn't expect that are bridging these fields and bridging the gap between the arts and the sciences. And for this to work, you really need scientists who are engaged and interested in some things broadly beyond their field and you need artists who, and humanities scholars who are equally engaged in the sciences. And I think there are so many other research areas which don't exist yet, but definitely could and should that utilize these disciplinary connections. So in conclusion, I guess I just wanna say, if you are a sciences student, if you're in engineering, take that humanities elective, um, 
don't take it just because you have to take one that you're really excited about and interested in read widely if you are a writer if you play an instrument keep those things up you never know what kind of really exciting research project that might lead to down the road and you know even if you don't end up designing animatronic movie puppets um, it'll make you a better and more well-rounded scientist and engineer and if you're a humanities student the humanities are not soft or less cutting edge they're essential they're how we communicate and relate to each other and hold each other accountable and i guess i would say you know go to that take that weird science elective go to the lecture on newton read up on the sciences that you're interested in stay up to date you never know maybe it'll inspire a great piece of science fiction or you never know the next great climate novel and we need it thank you <laughs>